Hi everyone, how are you today? In this video, I'd like to share with you eight books that changed my life in some way, shape, or form. Um, starting off very dramatic, I know. But this is something that came to mind over the last couple of days. I know I've talked about some of these books in various videos, but I thought, why not bring them all together in one video and uh, just have them here for reference. Um, this is really just a selection, obviously. Uh, I really do take a lot from most books I read, but I really tried to narrow it down to books that I think of as reading milestones, if you will, and even favorites, although I don't really, um, I don't really do favorites these days. Um, if you've checked out my blog, you'll know that I try to keep a list of books that really affected me deeply, or as Kafka would say, was an axe that broke the frozen sea inside me. So these books kind of fall into that category. First book I have here is Volume 1 of The Complete Sherlock Holmes by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, I read the Sherlock Holmes series when I was about 9 or 10, and it wasn't even this copy. I had found my parents' copy of the complete, or not the complete, the, uh, the illustrated Sherlock Holmes, which only had like the Adventures, The Memoirs, The Return, The Hound of the Baskervilles. I think those were the the ones that that collection had anyway. Um, between the ages of about 9 and 12, I read the whole series. And this book really, well, first of all, I could hardly put it down. It was one of the few books that I just was completely engrossed in as a child. And uh, actually... I shouldn't say few. I mean, I was really a reader, but this book in particular was like the tip of the top as far as I was just glued to these books. And honestly, I didn't understand a lot of it. So, you know, things like blackmail just kind of went over my head at the time, but I was so impressed by Sherlock Holmes' ability to make deductions and find the truth and challenge people and just be himself. I was just really inspired by that and Sherlock Holmes kind of became a hero for me. Like I would sort of aspire to be like just as um, self-composed and aware and alert and smart as him. Now, obviously, uh, didn't quite make it there, but um, yeah, he was a big hero for me, and I was really into the Sherlock Holmes series for a long time. In fact, um, I would I would read spin-off stories, I found other fans online, and I also wrote some really terrible fan fiction. By terrible, I mean it was just very cheesy and childish, but, you know, it was fun. It was a really good time, and... And yeah, I taught, I learned a lot about the world from this, from the series. So I will always have fond memories of that. And I think Sherlock Holmes is probably still my favorite character. The next book I read a, a little bit during my Sherlock Holmes phase, but um, I, I kind of consider this coming second. So this is Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, which I've mentioned a few times. This book is certainly one of the world's favorite classics, and I certainly fell in love with it as a 12-year-old girl. I think it's a good introductory classic, actually, because it starts when Jane Eyre is a small child, and so you can kind of, uh, you know, can almost view it as a kind of young adult fiction, except, you know, it's about her whole coming-of-age story. Um, I still love the story of Jane Eyre. I haven't read it in years, but I read it a few times as a teenager. I don't know if I will like it again the next time I read it, or I should say I don't think I'll like it quite as much because I've kind of um, outgrown love of the Rochester types. But, you know, it's a great story and it's so memorable. There's so many great scenes in Jane Eyre. And I think Charlotte Bronte really did something different in this book compared to a lot of other female authors. You know, she really didn't care if people thought that she 
was writing in a way that was not expected of women back in the 19th century, and yet she still maintained such incredible integrity. And Jane Eyre, of course, is a great, a great moral heroine and a very solid character. So, yeah, lots to love about Jane Eyre still. So, fast forward to a few years later, I think most people have read Heart of Darkness at some point, but in case you haven't, it's sort of set, I want to say early 1900s, and it's about um, this sailor Marlowe who gets on a boat and ends up, I think, becoming the captain of a, a steamer. I'll be honest, the details are a little hazy in my mind, but anyway, long story short, uh, when I discovered this book, I had never read anything like it before. Uh, Conrad's style kind of takes the 19th century and brings it into the 20th. This story starts out as just a sailor telling a story, but it turns into a huge psychological drama as this sailor Marlowe is looking for a white man named Kurtz who is lording it over in Africa and just acting really atrociously. Now, this book, incidentally, has become rather controversial recently, uh, which is something I definitely want to dig into more the next time I read it and read some critique on it. But writing-wise, I was completely blown away by what he, with what he did in Heart of Darkness, and it opened up to me Joseph Conrad, obviously, and really stretched my, my expectations for what literature could be. So, yes, I will always appreciate that part of Heart of Darkness. Another book that got me to think differently about literature was The Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka. I've done a lot of videos or segments on Kafka in the past, so you know I'm a huge fan of him. Um, this was my first Kafka, and it's a book I will actually recommend to pretty much everybody because you can read it on so many levels. Basically, in college, I, I somehow came across this book. I can't even remember exactly how. And again, I had never read anything like this before. Um, Kafka, in case you're not aware, he, he writes pretty simply, and yet in these excruciatingly long paragraphs, he has this entire world that he's created, which is both familiar and unfamiliar. You know, it's pure escapism in the sense that he's writing about people who um, turn into insects or they get arrested one morning for no reason. And yet it's, uh, it's familiar because the themes in the story of loneliness and anxiety, um, confusion, fear bureaucracy, capitalism. I mean, there's just so many different themes you can pull out of here that are familiar. So, uh, yeah, his books are kind of hit and miss for me, but this did introduce me to him. It blew my mind that anyone could write like this. And I really found a lot of comfort, strangely enough, reading Kafka because I just saw so much of the world, my world, in his world. Okay, this book is one that is really hit or miss for a lot of people. For me, this book was incredibly significant. This is Till We Have Faces, a myth retold by C.S. Lewis, and I'm pretty sure I have mentioned this before as well. Um, this is a retelling of Cupid and Psyche. Honestly, I didn't have any prior knowledge of that myth, so I went into this completely completely new to that. Uh, Till We Have Faces, then, in my opinion, is a, a pagan fairy tale of sorts. It starts with this royal family, and it's narrated by the, quote, ugly sister, um, who has a beautiful half-sister that she is really protective of, and she really loves this sister, and just would do anything to protect her and take care of her. This book gets pretty dark in parts, 
And what really happens is a tension and a conflict between the two sisters. So when I read this, I really was struck by two things. First, the female character in this book is so real. She is, you know, she's just so genuine. There's no sugarcoating. She's not uh, a cardboard cutout or a complete stereotype. Like she's just a real person. And the part that, you know, changed my life, so to speak, was I really saw a lot of my own self in the main character, which is a little embarrassing to admit, but once I realized that this character and what Lewis was critiquing in this book related to me personally, I was, well, first of all, the timing could not have been better because I, I realized what, what the problem was. And then I started thinking, okay, this, like, this book came to me at just the right time. I needed to read this, and it was just such an eye-opening moment. Um, I can't get into any spoilers in this book because it's quite dramatic if you do happen to read it. Um, but all in all, I just think it's a, a wonderful story with a great message. And yeah, I think the personal side of it is something that it's not going to... It's not going to affect everyone on that level, but it really affected me very personally. Okay, this is a book I have certainly talked about in the past. This is Works of Love by Søren Kierkegaard. Um, I'm not going to go into it in detail here um, since I did a video on Kierkegaard, but this book, which I read, I want to say 2015, 2016, this completely changed the way I thought about my relationships with people because uh, Kierkegaard is talking about all kinds of love in this book and he's writing from the perspective of Christian existentialism, which is something I've personally come to be a lot more interested in recently. I mean, I really can relate to so much of what he says. But anyway, um, this book really challenged me to view others in a, a a more Christian light, I guess. Like, thinking about the fact that God is with you at all times, and therefore he's with you in all of your relationships, and he is the, he, he needs to be the center of everything. Even, you know, your relationships with your enemies, right? Yeah, this, this book was, uh, you know, if you've ever read Kierkegaard, it's not exactly light reading, but it's one of his easier books, believe it or not. There's so many good quotes in here, so much good good stuff. I'm not going to, again, redo the video I did previously, but I would recommend this for Christians specifically. And uh, it certainly is a book that's just stuck with me ever since. Now for a piece of nonfiction, this is... South by Sir Ernest Shackleton. His account of his, I believe it was his second expedition to the Antarctic, um, which ended in tragedy, as you can see from the uh, cover. Well, not complete tragedy. Um, I won't give anything away, but it's, it's a mixed experience, let's put it that way. Would really recommend getting a copy with the pictures because... This book is not particularly sensationalized or, oh, isn't that cute? Um, not particularly sensationalized or, um, like, flowery. <laughs> he just tells it like it is. But there were some really amazing things that happened to Shackleton and his crew as they um, tried to get back home after their accident. And so this book was quite interesting from that perspective, but I just fell in love with the the polar exploration genre after that because it's just amazing what people will do in these situations and what they will do when they're just pursuing something that doesn't have any immediate payback I guess like you know, the Arctic is not exactly, or I should say the Antarctic is not a place people are going in droves to live, right? At least not yet. Um, so 
actually at the time, one of the big main goals of these expeditions was to compete as uh, European nations. So there was a competitive spirit going on, but there wasn't a lot of, I'd say, monetary value in going to Antarctica. It was mostly for the the prestige and the, you know, being able to say you guys went there first and you guys made this milestone and that kind of thing. So anyway, um, I also did a whole video on polar exploration. Be sure to check it out if that interests you. All right, last one here. This is back to fiction, but with nonfiction uh, inspiration, I guess. This is The Sea and Poison by Shusaku Endo. This is a very bleak book. This might be the toughest book I've ever read. And I've mentioned it before, but I had a massive book hangover after this one. I was so disturbed by it for like weeks. Um, this is about, well, this is written by a Japanese author and he's reflecting on the human experimentation that Japan did during World War II. This story is told more or less from the perspective of this Dr. Suguro who ends up participating in some of this human experimentation. Um, but the, the story actually follows multiple characters, his colleagues, and, and so forth. Yeah, this is a rough book, but it really changed my entire perspective on a lot of things. Like, I used to have a fairly simplistic view of the world, and then I had a professor in college, a history professor, who really opened my eyes to a lot of things that that uh, I'd only heard one side of the story previously, or um, things happening in other places in the world that I'd never heard of before. That was kind of the beginning of my eyes getting opened, if you will. This book was like the nail in the coffin to my old perspective, which, again, I think my old perspective being very US-centric, like, my country is the best and all that sort of thing. And this book, and then subsequently researching the United States uh, reaction to these experiments um, just opened my mind to, you know, how gray the world is, how imperfect any one country is. I actually did a whole podcast on this, which I'll link to in the description if you're interested. It's uh, not my best podcast, but I just, I did go over the research that I read about these topics and just went into it in more detail. Anyway, this book definitely changed my life. Um, I was already on this trajectory, but it, it just, it took me a little bit further. Not only that, though, I want to say this book is very good from a spiritual perspective because, you know, he questions or he brings up this idea that maybe someone could be truly repentant and sorry for what they did. And, you know, how do you, how do you even go forward after such crimes have been committed? It's a really good question, you know, because the more you read about history, the more you realize nobody can really say, oh, we're, we're spotless. Like, we never did anything wrong. Like, everyone has these skeletons in their closet and, you know, trying to figure out how to move forward is, is the big question. So, yeah, it's a short little book. I liked it much better than Silence, even though Silence is his more famous novel. But, uh, yeah, life-changing. Alright, thanks for watching this longer video. Um, let me know what books changed your life. I'd be really curious to know. Please like the video if you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time.